Hi, I am David Dobson. Welcome to the conversations. Today, my guest is Dr. Mandy Hansen. Today, we will be discussing the role of informal housing in resort communities. Dr. Mandy Hansen is, is principal at Insight Specialty Consulting, a Vancouver-based boutique firm uh, specializing in real estate strategy, project management, and management consulting. Uh, she received her doctorate in social sciences from Royal Road University. It's a great pleasure to uh, to to have you on my show, uh, Mandy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm I'm dialing in today. I'm visiting to Victoria today uh, on the traditional and unceded territories of the Lekwungen peoples. So to start off, uh, what is informal housing? Um. It's it's a very broad, broadly defined. It's really any form of unauthorized accommodation. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we think of it, we think of like the favelas up the hillsides behind Rio or the slums expanding uh, out beyond Johannesburg in South yeah. Africa. Yeah. Here in in Canada and the North North America, we would call them tent cities. That's how it kind of manifests for us. Um, cars parked along random side streets, you know, hashtag van life, yeah, yeah. Uh, basement suites, five foot yeah. ceilings. All of those would be considered informal housing in our context. So why informal housing and an important issue? Um, it's ex it, especially in developing countries, it is the vast majority of housing that is available. It's the only stuff that's being developed. Uh, and especially for... The poor working class folks, it's really all that they have for themselves. Um, in these con in developing contexts, their uh, informal housing or informal settlements is generally put on lands where they have no permission to be or to build. Um, so that that adds a, a layer of complexity depending on who owns those lands and who has authorized, you know, has a authority to authorize that development. Um, ultimately becomes a human rights issue. Um, housing is a human right. Uh, and if we're, if, if it's not available or available to be purchased or available to be given it, the turning to self-help housing becomes a human rights issue. Um, and another issue that we see, um, not again, not so much in Canada, um, you often see mass displacement or destruction of those settlements uh, mm -hmm. by those authorities. Um, so there's stories of folks that have gone to work for the day and come back mm -hmm. and find their whole neighborhood raised to the ground with all their stuff in it. Mm -hmm. um, so that becomes a, a much bigger human rights issue. Mm -hmm. For your doctoral research, you looked into the role of informal housing in resorts, uh, the resorts communities. Why, what draw your interest in this area? Um, I have a, most of my practice, a large part of my practice is in the, in the realm of social housing. That's my background. Okay. Um, so as part of that work, I, I didn't actually see us doing or trying to do a lot to prevent the development of slums. Um, so I really, I, you know, I kind of thought, you know, at a certain point, we're just going to have to learn how to manage them because they're, they're coming, they're here yeah. and we're not doing anything about it. Okay. Um, I had done my master's research on tourism resorts in the Caribbean and kind of okay. the infrastructure required to support and develop them. Uh, so I saw kind of a nice transition to focus mm -hmm. on just specifically housing infrastructure in these contexts. Okay. For your research, you chose to study the informal housing market in Mazaltan, Mexico. Why did you choose Mazaltan? Um, I, I love Mazaltan. It's my favorite city in Mexico. I just love it. <laughs> Um, I've been going there for years and years uh, and not just hanging out poolside yeah. at the resort. Um, yeah. I usually rent a uh, rent apartment. Yeah. I'll stay there for weeks or months. Yeah. Um, so it's, and it just, I just love the city. Okay. Um, so after having spent over a dozen years down there, yeah. Yeah. you know, I've got, a, I had a decent network. I, I knew a bunch of people yeah. that could help and could connect me. Um, I thought I knew how the city kind of worked. I didn't, but that's okay. Uh, I learned. Um, I also saw a lot of similarities between okay. Vancouver and Mazatlan, right? Okay. Mazatlan yeah. is is a real city. It's a it's yeah. a port city. It yeah. hails from colonial pre colonial times. Uh -huh. um, it has a really diverse economy, mm -hmm. right? It, it has mm -hmm. the one of three natural deep sea ports 
on the western side of the Americas. Mm -hmm. uh, there's fishing, there's farming, there's mining, mm -hmm. there's tourism, of course. Yes. Uh, but not, you know, it's not, it's raison d'être the way that it is in, say, Cancun or Cabo. Right. Um, it's kind of, you know, the way that Vancouverites treat tourists. It's like, ah, I'll learn how to drive, right? Um, very much <laughs> that same vibe. Uh, which I which I appreciate, right? Yes, you go to a restaurant, yeah. you don't necessarily get an English menu. I yes, like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also find yeah. the geography fairly similar, right? Okay, it's it's yeah. on the mouth of a fairly large delta, uh, yeah. so there's that farmland that extends up until the mountains. So I I saw I I feel a lot of uh, kindredness between Vancouver and Mazatlan. Nice, nice. And so, how did you go about doing your research there? Um. I started with a really broad research question. Okay. Um, I didn't want this to be an extractive process with me trying to get answers to my questions yes. from them, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I had a very broad research question, just really trying to solicit what it was that, that uh, folks in Mazatlan wanted to tell me about their mm -hmm. city and about yes. housing and informal housing and tourism. Um, so I started out with reading literally every book every article I could get my hands on, right? right. Just centering yeah. myself in the existing body of knowledge. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I tapped into my network. Okay. Uh, folks I already knew. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also a number of uh, Facebook um, groups for uh, snowbirds or, you know, English speaking yeah. immigrants or, or partial uh, uh, occupants. Um, and those folks were really helpful. I, I just, posted saying that I'm coming down for my research does anybody know anybody and I got amazingly connected to nice. government officials and universities and community groups and business leaders cool. and I talked to anyone that would talk to me nice. right absolutely anyone and yeah. I got them to introduce me to others yeah I'm not yeah. a sociologist so yeah. I stayed away from trying to document personal yeah. stories and personal experiences right. it's not my scene yeah. I would not be able to do it justice right um, and I really just focused on that development process, the economics, the land use, really anything that would intersect into those topics. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I spent that winter in Mexico, uh, November to November 2019 to February 2020. Yeah. Um, and I was privileged to go into community and okay. see how informal settlements, they call them yeah. invasions, yeah. were created. Yeah. Um one of my personal best experiences was going to three different settlements with city officials. Okay. Um, one was what they called kind of a, a poster child mm -hmm. for good settlement, a yeah. uh, good settlement process. Uh, another one that was a settlement but could not be regularized. It was in dangerous location. They yeah. can't support that, so it yeah. won't. They can't get. They can't support it. Right. Uh, and another one was on Ahito lands, which are a farming commune kind of thing. And they look yeah. at subdividing their lands. So three di very different settlement types. Yeah. Um, nice. We talked about challenges and opportunities. Um, yeah. I had originally thought I'd do a, a lot of analysis on land pricing because I'm an appraiser yeah. by trade going back yeah. many years. So that's yeah. kind of Oh, that would be an easy win. Mm -hmm. um, I want to see if there was significant differences pricing wise between formal and informal and where it was on that regularization process. Yeah. Uh, no data to be had, just mm. nothing. Mm. Um, so I turned instead looking at um, density and land, land sizing, land allocation. I mm. engaged my friends over at Liquor Geospatial to do some of that work for me so I could have some of that uh, quantitative element in my in my research oh, yeah cool. very neat and what did you learn from your research in Mazeltan? <clears throat> um honestly the biggest thing for me was just how normal these communities are like you, you hear words like slums and squatters and it just does not paint a pretty okay. picture okay um but really they're just communities like any mm -hmm. other they're just mm -hmm. part of the regular housing market Mm -hmm. regular families raising mm -hmm. their yeah. kids going to work caring for their parents all of the things that you do in a normal subdivision right um and you really can't tell which neighborhoods used to be informal or not mm -hmm. over time yeah. right yeah um i was also really surprised how much support there was from the municipality mm -hmm. uh, and how formal that invasion process actually was mm -hmm. like there's developers probably mm -hmm. Development companies mm -hmm. and pre-sales of mm -hmm. lots and mm -hmm. homeowners associations, 
um, the city, like, like they have design guidelines mm -hmm. where they lay out streets and lot sizes. Um, the city gets involved. They provide services. They put, yeah. pave the street. Eventually, they raise titles for these properties. Not mm -hmm. soon, not quickly, but, you know, in yeah. time. Yeah. Um, they're just so much more process than I expected. Mm -hmm. Documentable, flow chartable mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it was just amazing. Cool. Um, I also found that, you know, density, they're all about density. Uh, everyone gets a tiny, tiny little parcel of land. Think mm -hmm. like 1,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. That's it. You, okay. everyone gets 1,500 square feet. Okay. Um, if you are uber rich living on the golf course in your mansion, mm -hmm. you get 5,000 square feet. Okay. That's it. Okay. <laughs> everyone's everyone's shoehorned in there. there. You don't yes. get a lot of space. Very, very nice. Based on your research, what are your recommendations? Um, speaking to, to Mazatlan and to, to communities like that, um, I'd encourage them not to get overly bureaucratic with okay. their zoning and land use okay. policies, right? Okay. They don't currently have issues with street homelessness or even affordability because okay. they let the market serve. If someone's buying, someone's selling, right? So don't break that supply pipeline like we've done okay. in Canada. Yeah. Um, one thing they do need to do is pace infrastructure development mm -hmm. to the rest of the development. Yeah. Uh, water and the very troublesome uh, piece of infrastructure that they need to work on. Um, but yeah, just keep that supply pipeline going. And uh, it's they're they're doing, in my humble opinion, doing a better job of it than we are. That's great. Finally, do you have any advice for housing planners and researchers? Um, I'll speak most closely to planners just because they're the, the yeah. folks I pick on the most. Okay. Um, housing really is an absolute necessity, right? right. Yes. And either the government provides it the market builds it or yeah. people will do it for themselves. Yeah. Um, housing development will keep up with demand yeah. as it will, yeah. either your way or or their way. And yeah. and planners get to pick their poison, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, our current approach of telling people to go back in time and just not be born is not working. It's true. Uh, right? And, yeah. and density ultimate is not a bad word yeah. unless you think slum is a good word. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, again, you're picking your poison. Yeah. In the aesthetics of urban design, yeah. the sanctity of that public process will right. fail in the face of human need. Right. right? We will yeah. we will circle back entirely yeah. to our own early years with yeah. our own slums yeah. that we worked so very hard to get rid of. And yeah. now they're coming back because right. the pendulum has swung too far. We need to swing it back. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Mandy. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.